a woman in Australia in 2021 means that you are in a bit of a limbo state. So on the one hand, we can see that we're not the worst country in the world in terms of conditions for women, but equally we're frustrated when we can see things that could be better. That limbo state means that we possibly don't fight as hard as we possibly could to make this country the best possible country for women. If we think about the people that real, we really need to help, we need their viewpoints represented. While women in Australia certainly are the majority, um, the majority of roles um, of power are taken up by men. So the reality is we are going to need them to step aside and share those roles. That's why we need them as part of the she covering. Can you hear me? Okay. No, no, okay, yes. now, now we can. Now we're good to go. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to um, the last session of uh, the day, Fixing the Leaky Pipeline, the Champions of Women's Leadership. Um, I, I think the title of this panel is quite um, evocative. Uh, we have to find a way to fix the pipeline, including in the business world and on the job market that tends to lose women along the way. Um, what are the holes and cracks and fault lines that make it so hard, maybe easier than, than a few decades ago, but still quite complicated, I would say, for women to leave university, enter the job market, climb the career ladder, and reach and retain leadership positions? And what do we do to tackle these issues? These are obviously million-dollar questions, but we invited the champions of women's leadership uh, the speakers that you see here on stage with me and that I'm going to introduce in just a second, um, who are representatives of um, companies and organizations that are working really hard uh, to fix these leaks. I'm going to give them a chance to uh, share their thoughts and um, talk about what their organizations are doing, uh, and then I'll leave some time uh, for, for the audience to, to ask their questions. Um, so we have Blanca Trevino, uh, Denis Terrien, uh, Matthew Layton, and Monica Possa. Uh, you see their job titles on, uh, on screen. Um, I'm going to start right away with um, Blanca Trevino, who, by the way, traveled all the way from Mexico to be here today, and she has a plane. Um, <laughs> to Madrid and then to the United States this evening. So, um, but just um, please uh, think about the questions you want to address to our speakers. We had a really nice chat in the speaker's room just a few minutes ago. We were discussing our views and our, the, the different peculiarities <laughs> between our countries of origin. So um, I hope this can be interactive, make it interactive between yourselves as well. Um, so Blanca, the first question is, um, is for you. Um, you're the co-founder of SoftTech. Um, you, you're, you sit on quite a few boards. Um, we always say or we discuss that talent shouldn't have gender or race. Um, and you know it shouldn't be discriminated, but it still is in many in many cases. Um, and in Latin America, um, there is probably a culture that doesn't make it so easy um, at this point in time for women to climb the career ladder and to reach leadership positions. What is your thought on this? Yeah. First of all, not just uh, um, think how grateful I am to be invited, but also. My apologies, because I do have to leave to take this plane. I thought we were running a little bit late. But let me get back to, the, to, the, to your question. Um, I think it's interesting when you look at this. Let me start by saying, when I had my first job, just think about this. I, the very first day, they asked me to sign my resignation letter. And the reason to do that is because it, it was very clear that if you get married, then there was not going to be a question of firing you. It's, it's you, under, you have to understand that is the case. And that was more than 30 years ago. So I have to say that we have made progress. At least they no longer ask you for the resignation letter. And uh, I did resign. I did resign. They didn't ask me for that when I got, because we wanted to start softing. So it's, um, it's a difference. But um, I think it's interesting, and we discussed this uh, in the speaker's room, and also I've been, this, is, this has been part of the different panels. There are 
cultural issues. It's not just the kind of things that, that companies can do in order to make sure that they give opportunities to women. I, I have, coming from Latin America, I would like to focus on things that are not necessarily related just to the policies that are in place from a company. It's also understanding uh, to, to what we discussed before, that it's, it's just a, a work not just from the company, families, society, in order to have those women join eventually the, the workforce. Uh, it's interesting when you, when you think, if you ask me in different companies, I do see policies in place, I do see that they have kind, that kind of awareness of how important it is to bring the talent. But also at the same time, it, it is very frustrating to see that even in, in family-owned companies of more than three generations, still there, are not, there has not been a daughter, a sister, a wife, not a single CEO. So you have to question and you have to say, is this then just a matter of creating this kind of policies within the, the, the company or is it something that we have to work before? I think in one of the panels yesterday or doing, someone mentioned that you have to start uh, from elementary school and high school to really promote that. And, and I agree is that. So, so I'll stop there. And uh, because I, I would like to say that it is also a cultural issue. There has been progress within the companies. There is so much more we can do. We need, we need people. Like Dennis, that are the kind of things that they are doing and he has been doing for many years. But progress has been made, but there is a lot of things we have to do also uh, in, from a cultural perspective in order for women not to feel guilty. Because sometimes they do feel guilty. If, if the culture is not there, and you want to say, I, 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 I want to keep on working, they will look at you and will say, so you're not taking care of your children. And it's difficult, it is difficult, but I'll stop there. So um, Matthew, uh, Blanca just mentioned uh, the, the cultural perspective, but there's also an industry one, right? Um, so what do you think about the industry? I mean. What is the issue in certain industries, for example, in the legal industry, for women to progress and, for example, to make partner? And what are you doing at Clifford Chance to tackle those issues? Yeah, so, so I think the, in the legal industry, in common with um, many professional services industries, the issue is. Uh, I think there's an issue with your microphone. <laughs> Try again. I think it should working. work now. Okay. So, um, yeah, so in, in the legal industry, in common with most of the professional services industries, um, we don't have such a problem uh, in terms of gender diversity at the recruitment stage. In fact, in most of our jurisdictions, we're a global firm with about 3,500 lawyers around the world. In most of our jurisdictions, the uh, entry at the graduate level is, is at 50% or well over 50% in many cases. So the issue really is one of retention and promotion. Um, and just coming back to the pipeline analogy, um, the real challenge is the pipeline is complex and it's multifaceted and it's quite a, in professional services, um, quite a clear career path progression through that pipeline. Um, but it, could, it is all about values and, and culture. And one of the things that we've been focusing on a lot recently is that just like any pipeline infrastructure that you have to look at, you have to continually repair it, you have to survey it and review it, and importantly, you have to continue to upgrade it throughout the process if you're going to be successful. So we do that and look through really three lenses. Um, we see it as a campaign because we're never going to get the perfect pipeline. So we see it as a campaign and we look through three lenses. So change the rules, change the culture, and importantly, change the lived experience. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to share some sort of examples on each of those, but um, I think it is really important to think of this as a campaign. It's about social change within the organization and how you bring that out through inter, inter, uh, uh, ac actions across each of those. But the most important thing, and we've heard a lot about it over the last two days, is, is about leadership. Um, and leaders being vocal about the values that they want to promote throughout the organization. And, um, we have a saying in the firm, which is, you know, value that stays in your head is a secret. So you have to have leaders who are prepared to go out and be vocal and uh, take tangible action in support of their values. 
That's, um, that's a good point. And Denis, I, I turn to you because I think you're probably one of those leaders. Um, we, we had a few conversations and it seems um, that uh, your mentality and also um, your optimism, if I uh, may say, is not common, um, or at least it's not a given at this point in time, especially um, at certain levels in, um, in companies. Uh, so if you can share your thoughts, but also can you give us a few examples on what you're doing at Salesforce to promote um, gender equality and diversity? Right. So if we step back a little bit, this crisis has been a crisis in, in social, in academic, and, and, and in health. However, I believe there's also a leadership crisis. And this is why you know, I thank uh, Audrey and Chiara for organizing those kind of events, because what we need to do is to think of what kind of world we want to create. Hundreds of billions of dollars is going to be put in the economy, and, and if we don't have leaders that take you know, those kind of issues seriously, then we could have the same world after than the one we had before. So if you look at the world we want to create, and imagine yourself or your parents 50 years ago, somebody would go and look for order and stability and responsibility, and that person would call on the government. Today, in most of the G7 countries, only 20% of the people believe in their government. They will look for social, and, uh, and, social, and they would go uh, historically to the families and one couple out of two divorces. And they would look for the meaning in life, and they would go to religion. And apart from the US and India, in most of the G7 countries, then religion is only 20 to 30% of the population. So what has remained is companies. Companies is there to help provide most of the population those kind of topics. This is where we at Salesforce believe that, that businesses are the greatest platform for change. And it is the responsibility of the leaders within this room to embark on that change to define what kind of world you want tomorrow and build it. So one of the topics that we are focusing a lot at Salesforce is on equality. And uh, we had earlier uh, CEOs and chairmen of very large organizations that were created 100 years ago, and they were talking about how to change the organization. Salesforce, we are very, very lucky. We were founded only 20 years ago. And equality is one of the four values that, was, that the company was based on, together with trust, innovation, and customer success. So equality is something that we do every day. You don't even think about it. You do it as you walk. Right? So how do you do it? And let's, talk, uh, let's focus now on the gender equality. So not only we have you know, the equal pay. This is like a given. And it's actually measured every six months. We have equal promotion. Each time you promote people, you look at, you know, are we doing the right, uh, the, 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 the right element? We try, you know, we are in STEM, which is, you know, we are in technology. So it's, we have, you know, it's more difficult to recruit into technology. In Western countries, it's about 20 to 25% of the people that are female in technology. We're happy to be above that. You know, we're not 50% there, but we're striving hard. But the examples of things that we do, for example, I, re I had to recruit a new head for France. We had a headhunter, and the headhunter could only recruit a female candidate. And the headhunter told me, Denis, but there are a lot of male candidates also. And I told that person, for 50 years, you've always been looking at 50% of the population. Let's try to work at the other 50% for once. And yes, I'm making a biased decision to recruit a female leader. Yes, I am. I recruited as well, as well a female leader for Africa, and she's going to start in a couple of months. So as you make some active decision like this, it's going to help transform the company. On every day as well, you know, and, and when it's part of your DNA, you don't even think about it, but you make decisions on the go all the time. I was sharing earlier, you know, at Salesforce, what we also tend to do is, if you're pregnant, we more than double the amount of time that you want. If you adopt a kid, whether it's your male or female, you've got six months off. And not only this, but it doesn't hurt your pay and your promotion. Last January, I promoted a lady in Spain. She took nine months off for her kid. We actually promoted her as she was on, vaca uh, on not vacation, on, on maternity leave, <laughs> I'm sorry. It was also You wish, <laughs> it's not a vacation. No, it was not vacation, it was on maternity leave. So as she was off, we also, uh, we promoted her. So, 
you know, I, I'd like to say what we do at Salesforce is so ingrained into our values that you know, it helps us go through the, the everyday decisions, you know, little by little, you make decisions, and at the end of the day, you're able to have a much more equal, um, e e equal uh, more equality and diversity. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, because the battle is there. I was amazed when we, t we had this lady from uh, Saudi Arabia who told us that in Saudi Arabia, 64% of the students in technology are female. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, you know, I talked to my uh, head of employee success and human resources, I said, what is it that we're doing wrong in our countries? So I said, it's only 20 to 30%. So this is so that we have to work on that. And we, as we believe that business is the biggest platform for change, it is our responsibility to change that. And we have a goal. You know, so this is something which I've, I've learned today. You know, in terms of mentorship as well, are we able to have the right mentor for all our female leaders? I don't think so. I don't think so. When we look at all the coaches we have in the company, everybody can be coached. About two-thirds are male coaches. So that as well is that appropriate. It doesn't help us. So yes, we've done a lot. We still have a lot to go. And that's why I'm delighted to be here. So, um, Monica, I, I turn to you. Do you, um, do you agree um, with the need that it's uh, businesses that uh, can drive change? And considering what he said about um, people's skepticism towards governments, uh, I, I think this makes the, the role of companies even, even more important. What do you think companies can do to empower women and um, to promote diversity? Thank you, Silvia. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here today, and I take the opportunity to say that this is a very important moment. I think that COVID created a discontinuity, and all discontinuities are very fertile moment of change if we take them as an action item. So I very much like the fact that this is a call for action, so I have my personal idea of action, so we, we can come back to that later, but I think it's very important for us to be here. Um, two points on, on your question, Silvia. One is about uh, companies, as the other one is about uh, what for me is not a matter of company, but is a matter of government. Companies can do a lot. Company in the stakeholder capitalism, companies have a duty to do something, and there is a sensibility in the world on, on this. And uh, how can we do that? Uh, I think, first of all, but this is uh, almost clear, that this is a business matter. This is not an HR matter. This is not a force for good matter. It's a business matter, women empowerment, and should be treated as such, which means, uh, first of all, led by business people. Second, measured with KPIs and targets, targets and KPIs that should go in the balance scorecard of people, because given that this is a business matter, they should go there, they should be measured, and people should be rewarded about that, and role models should be identified on that point. And this is one part. The second part, which is again a company matter, is that this is also a cultural thing. And you know, culture is something that takes a lot of role modelship, of leadership, of resilience, of training uh, to change. So in the meanwhile, so large companies like generally listed companies, uh, like many of us are here, have an advantage because we are pushed by investor, by proxy advisor, you know, by our uh, shareholders. Uh, and so we are moving in that direction and maybe we can comment on example. But what about the companies that are not listed company and don't have this kind of pressure in a culture that is not yet aligned with these uh, topics? And so here I am, and uh, I believe that the government can do a lot, and I believe that us, as uh, the G20 Women Forum, should have a call on, on action, and actually there is one in the 10th uh, proposal, on uh, increasing the women quotas also on the management side. I know that this is a very contentious point. I know that this is very difficult. If you ask a small Monica Possa, young Monica Possa, I would be horrified, you know? I'm a performer, I work hard, I'm a, you know, I did the good school. But then 
I look around and I see that we need to accelerate. And the moment is now. We are going to lose 100 years if we don't do something now. And so I think that besides being good companies that do things that are relevant for the business, we should also help our government to do the things that are good for the business as well. And some companies do a culture would not do by themselves. So that's my call to action. And then if you want later, we can come back to us. Definitely. And if you all want to jump in, you wanted to say well, something, Matthew. I, I know we were fighting already over this stuff. <laughs> fighting now, but let's say that the topic uh, yes, three and that's why I'm going to go back to Blanca years, about the quotas. But first, Matthew. Yeah, no, well, I think we'll probably come on to the discussion on quotas in a minute. But I just wanted to touch on one example in the UK where the government introduced um, uh, pay gap reporting yes. uh, four years ago and you know if you look at the advancement in the uk on uh, uh, pay gap uh, gender pay gap over that period it's it's not been massive and at one level you'd say that that's quite disappointing progress but actually i think when you look and see how has it changed behaviors fundamentally and also how has it enabled people to and force people to gather the data that enables them to really shine the light issues within the companies, then I think it's made a massive, massive change. And I'm, I'm confident that that sort of intervention with government in changing the rules of, and putting a, a new framework in place will actually start to drive significant change and accelerate change as a result of that intervention. So I think there is, it's absolutely right, there needs to be full cooperation between, between governments and private businesses to, to do that. But we also have to recognize that change won't happen overnight, but, it, but I, they can be real accelerants. And I think the pay gap reporting was one. We, we've taken that and are now applying gender pay gap reporting across the whole of our business across the world and also extended it to ethnicity as well as a result of just the the, the detail insight that it gives us to actually be able to address issues within our, within our business more effectively. And also it's become a reputational issue uh, to some extent because I remember when it was first, uh, when it first came into force in the UK, what was it, about four years ago, I think 2017. Yeah, we all started reporting on it and you saw all these newspaper articles uh, discussing the companies that you know had bigger pay gaps the ones that uh, kind of had smaller pay gaps and it didn't look very good i don't think it looked great for those companies that were in the news because they had an enormous pay gap and so i think it kind of force them to address the issue. Totally. Again, it's a stakeholder issue. So it's both you know, the external stakeholders, but also stakeholders within your business as well, because you have to have a narrative to, to explain the progress that you're, you're making. And if you're not making progress, explain why you're not and how you're going to address that issue. Blanca, on to the quotas now. Um, <laughs> You've heard me before. Yes, exactly. So I want to comment um, from you yeah. on the quotas and uh, I think you have a different view um, to Monica's. No, and, and don't get me wrong, I do understand that there has to be a start and probably it should be with quotas. But um, I, I don't like quotas, being very honest, because it, they can be offensive. It, from, the, you, you might feel offended because sometimes when they invite you to a board, you will always question if you're there because they wanted to meet the quota. And not because you, have, you can add value to that board, right? It, so it's, it, from, certain perspective, from my perspective, quotas are needed. I cannot deny that. But it's important how you manage those quotas and how you can explain that the reason to have them is precisely that we have to accelerate this. But making sure that if you bring someone to that position, leadership position, boards, it's because they, they have merits and they, they have the experience that are needed. They're absolutely you're going to feel always you um, and, and uh, question and things like that. But it is important because otherwise you will see, I, I believe it's one of those more countries in which they, they have it, the from a board perspective, but there's not a single CEO. Not single, so they, they, they manage what they decided. They ask public companies to have to meet those quotas. But then you look and you said, not a single <coughs> not a single one. So that, that gives you an idea as to why it is not necessarily working the way it should be. I love the, the title pipeline, because just like Matthew mentioned, it is important how you see 
that, that, that pipeline in order to have those, those um, ready for leadership positions, for, for boards, uh, because otherwise it's not going to work. And uh, again, it, it will be unfair for the woman, if not managed correctly, but it's also unfair for the stakeholders, because if you just want to meet the quota, then just for that reason, then you will not, as a, any shareholder, any of the stakeholders will not get what they supposed to get from companies. I mean, it's, it's absolutely necessary, important to meet certain, um, not just the financial metrics, but also the other things. But uh, it's, it's again, they are needed. I don't like them because they, sometimes they are not managed the way they should. And you can take a look at those European countries, the, the Nordic countries. You'll see, they, they did manage those quotas for, for corporate governance but not a single woman CEO in, the, in that region. So uh, we have to work with them, manage them, have them, accelerate the process, but make sure that it is very clear that you will bring the most, the brightest talent, not, not necessarily just to meet the, the, the quota. And not just, again, women, it's, uh, it's diversity, right? And quotas to have a more diverse leadership teams and, and corporate. I think that's the problem we had in, in this country, right, Monica? Because we have uh, the requirement to have women on, um, yes. on boards, but if you look at the figures, we have very few women CEOs. Um, so, but I mean... That I, is because you have to work at the, the management right. board level. And, uh, just, uh, and then I will stop this discussion. But I think it's very important that also women ourselves, and I was totally against quota when I was younger and less experienced. But then you realize that there is a bias and people choose people that are similar. It's a, a natural moment. So when in Italy came the moment of the Legge Golfo Mosca, I remember myself, a lot of people saying, <gasps> all these women in board, but we don't have those qualified women around. <laughs> you know, we will have unqualified women in boards. And then three Edanter company put together 150 women that had at least DCV. So uh, I think it's a matter of looking around well and building, I agree with you, it should be based on merit. And then you build the pipeline with the management team because mm -hmm. the CEO comes from there. Mm -hmm. So when you are obliged, in a sense, in companies that have less vision, you will do it. And on ourselves as women, we shouldn't be scared about that because we have the merit. Now, sometimes I always, and I'm still like this, you know, I always say I've never asked for a pay raise in my life, entire life, and I'm not that young. Why? Because you always want to feel entitled to something. No. Sometimes, you know, people have to look around and uh, go with the merit, but uh, there should be some entitlement mm -hmm. based on merit. Sorry, I'm. A Denis, you um, you also mentioned your opposite bias earlier. So uh, Monica was talking about bias. You mentioned about the hiring bias. You also have a special recruiting um, uh, format. Right, so right. I think that if men, and I'm here I'm talking about men, we are not forced to change. We are not going to change. And because the whole world, a lot of the world was created by men. If one think about the internet, the internet was created by men. If we think of AI, which is going to dominate you know, data, it was created by, by men. I just heard that apparently the MIT has put a woman to think of AI in a different way. But today, you know, AI, internet, all this was created by men. Therefore, it could be, and again, it could be easier for men to go into that world. Uh, you know, when, when you assess people, one would tend to assess more IQ than EQ, whereas in EQ, I think female talents are much better than, than the male talents. Okay, why have we pushed more on IQ versus EQ when one knows that a leader will spend 80% of his or her time in emotional and driving people around her than, than just uh, you know, making the right decision in financial metrics? So the, the world has been created too much by men for men, and yes, it is time to change. And, and you have to dare. I'll, I'll give you an example. So at Salesforce, we have a phenomenal women's network with over 9,000 uh, female networks. 
But prior to Salesforce, I was in another company. We had 15,000 employees, and we didn't have a women network. So I decided to create one. And I took the, one of the you know, leader who was running a BU, and I said, create the way you want. And I went to see the HR, and I, and I tell, told her, because she, she told me, oh, Denis, you're going to have to come and tell us what we do. I said, no, no, no. Not only am I not going to tell you what I want you to do, but anything you're going to ask me, I will give it to you. Anything you ask me. And I made it public. My HR came to me and said, Denny, you're crazy. You're crazy. Maybe she could ask silly things. I said, if you think that, and she's leading one of the biggest BU in our company, we made a mistake early on. And if you think this, you have a problem. And so, you know, I was very, very strong at my HR, who happened to be a man. And that lady actually took this as an amazing empowerment, which is what we were talking about earlier. And together around her, she, you know, the idea that I had originally, which was wrong, was that she was going to take top leaders and create this employee network with top leaders. They said, no, 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 Denis, leadership goes throughout the organization. And she started her women's network with, you know, people that were on the shop floor, cleaning ladies, you know, head of marketing and head of BUs. And together, they came with a whole set of actions that we needed to take to you know, increase diversity and success of female leaders in the company. For me, that was one of the biggest learning that I had. You, know, you go on the trust of your employee and trust those leaders to make the appropriate decision. And when you've gone through one or two experiences like this, then you, I like to say it's easy to continue. And this is why you know, I was sharing early on, and to embark in this di diversity, is that one or two big decisions that you make. Yes, of course, we've put at Salesforce a female leader in France, a female leader in the UK, a female leader in Northern Europe, a female leader in Africa. So yes, we took these great decisions, but this is not enough. It's every day, how are you going to do that? And as you don't know, you need to get trained. Other example. So we, we're going to recruit about 20,000 people this year at Salesforce. You are not allowed to recruit, to be on the recruiting team, if you haven't been on a biased training program. Because we realized, it was incredible, that you know, on the inside, we had about 50% women, 50% female. On the outside, we were making more offers to the male than the female. Therefore, it was clearly a biased decision that men was making. So two things. A, you train the people of biased. And B, you ensure that within the recruiting team, you always have the same number of female and male making the decision. And you know, I could go on like this in the number of training. You know, um, we do on um, also some you know on, on diversity and inclusion, you know, or microaggression. Men are fantastic for microaggression because it's part of the way we were brought up. Especially if you're like me, over 50, it was part of behaving in Latin countries. And, and I have here my daughter, who is 26, and she was brought up in you know, West Coast of the, uh, California. And each time I say something wrong, she said, Daddy, this is microaggression. Would you say that to a male worker or a male? So all that training, an everyday training, I think will help us make better leaders. Therefore, yes, you need to have some very strict rules. Yes, you need to measure. And yes, us men, we need to learn how to behave in this to create a better world. Matthew, do you want to defend men? <laughs> well, no, I, I <laughs> certainly not. No, I, the, um, I just pick up a couple of points which I think are really interesting there. When I, I, we talk about this being a campaign, as I said earlier, and we look at it as a campaign be, for the very reasons that Denise mentions, is it is something that you have to, to go through every single day. And the most successful social campaigns for change actually bring people together onto common ground and behind a common goal and objective. And in a way, you know, I think there are times when you see people retreat from opportunities to, to, to make the firm and the, the world better for, because of fear. And we need to make sure one of the things we really focus on the firm is not pushing people away, but bringing people together. And two sort of quick examples around that. Reverse mentoring in our firm. Every, I have two reverse mentors. Um, one on uh, gender and uh, ethnicity, and one on uh, LGBT. And every leader in the firm has a reverse mentor. And it's incredibly powerful. These are relationships that have grown into 
from deep friendships, um, really insightful, and they're, they're absolutely mutually beneficial relationships, and they change the, the culture within the, within the firm. The other thing we've done a lot of is to recognize, just as you would with a, with a, with a pipeline, which is technical and, and uh, is, is you actually have to bring in some independent expertise sometimes. So we talk about holding the mirror up to ourselves constantly in the firm. And about um, three years ago, we worked with a, um, a, 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 an expert in organizational ethics. Um, and we asked them to come in and just have a run their data-based uh, and uh, evidence-based program on the firm. And of course, one of the things it told us was, and we should have known that, well, we did know this anyway, but actually, you know, law firm's quite hierarchical. You know, people work in small teams, you're working with partners, your career progression depends on the, the support of the partners. What that, that also means is it's very difficult to, um, to challenge within that organization. So we, were, we immediately then have moved to a campaign to actually celebrate and embrace challenge throughout the organization. And it's had transformational impacts. And, and you know, just as Denis was saying, his, his daughter challenges him. I have two daughters who challenge me all the time. But we actually want the organization to thrive on challenge by encouraging and embracing challenge within the firm. And that has to come from leaders, but it, all the way down, leaders mm -hmm. all the way through the organization, as Denise said. I suspect both of you are so passionate because you both have two daughters. That's, that's <laughs> why I ask him. Two daughters, a mother, two sisters. But it's interesting, right? Because you know that you have to do it. Well, you do it because you're convinced that it's important. But I, I think it also helps when you are surrounded by so many women because you want, you want to give them that opportunity, right? So it's, uh, and, and, and because that's the, the way that you see the world ahead, right? You, that's what you want for your daughter. So if you want that for your daughter, you have to start by creating, just like I mentioned, that kind of, that's where we want to go. And uh, that's where we should start. Otherwise, it's, uh, we're not going to be there and your daughters are not necessarily have the opportunities that you want. But, but it's interesting how passionate you are and how involved you have been doing this. Because when we talk about role models, sometimes we think about women role models. But we need role models, the kind of executives, the kind of companies that create that kind of environment. Probably the, those are, they are more important. So like you mentioned before, before the, the panel, um, they will look at you and they will not blame you or question you or they will, they will admire what you have achieved. Probably in the past they will say, are you sure you want to do this? But today they will look at you and say, he made the very, the, the best decision. Look at the, the, what he got back, right? I, I'd like to share an example of this. Somebody in the room who was just promoted as the vice president last year. So we had a job opening. And uh, we have a male and a female. Uh, we had two a male and a female who could apply. The male wanted the job, applied. The female candidate didn't apply. And I remember the first World, uh, Women's Forum that I attended 15 years ago. And there was this study by McKinsey that said, for a woman to apply to the role, she must feel that she has 80% of the skills. For the man to apply, he must feel that he has 40% of the skills. And maybe both of them had about 70% of the skills, right, or 75 However, I decided to promote the lady with telling her, I'm promoting you a little bit early. I would have liked you to be here six more months in this role, or one year, but we're gonna be here, we're gonna help you be successful. And it's our duty to help you. What happened? The gentleman became berserk, insulted the lady, he got fired immediately. But not everyone is like so, you. No, no, what I, I'd like to say this because for once, I, I thought of doing the reverse that we would have in a normal company. In a normal company, the guy would have, a, would have a, got the job, and the female would have said, okay, that's it. My turn will come later on. And she wouldn't have insulted. She wouldn't have fought. So this is why it has to be in, you know, it has to be in our DNA to always go and look for those talents and or for women here that are here, you know, I don't want to say fight for your rights because it's not, it's not a fight, but ensure that you have the skill and you, you, have, you deserve to get the power. Take your but seat at the table. That's because they think it works. Things, oh, I mentioned before the panel, and I think it's important. In, in, in some countries or cultures, it is not 
It is not bad when the man steps back in order for the woman to, to take any other position. It's very uncommon on certain countries or cultures. In the US, they do it very, I would say, easily. Because when you said they will apply for a position in Australia, and, but she's married, and her husband has a very important job, I don't know if, if he will be very happy if she applies. Although sometimes she feels that she has to step back and not apply for that, not because he, she doesn't have the experience, but because it might be a problem with her husband. I, I don't know if, I, I'm gonna ask you this before leaving. What about your wife? Do you like your wife to work or not? Because sometimes that is, some, every time that I ask this, they wanna have that for their daughters. But they said, no, that's different. My wife is different. Why, if, you are, if your wife has a very great promotion in uh, whatever, uh, the US, she was, will you go she, she, and move there because you want to support her? Or is just your daughters, not necessarily? She has an indication that she works more hours than I do. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Monica, no, you... I wanted to comment on what works, uh, you know, to and, make And that... also your call for action. Yes, my call for action on what works. What works uh, to me is really working on uh, ca in companies, in my experience, and I don't think that we are, you know, I don't think there are very few companies that actually made it, and I don't think we are one of those. Uh, but what works is working on one side of the culture, you know, what we were talking about, bias trainings, the bias all the people processes, uh, making sure that you really embed target uh, and target in the balance scorecard like we did, all the top leaders have targets in the balance scorecard. On the other side, uh, you have to help uh, the talented women to feel entitled because I feel that in some culture this topic about being entitled is there. And so, and so uh, I think this is also very important. Uh, and finally, the call for action. To me, it's very important if we can take home, we, given that we have the relationship with Minister Bonetti, if we can push this idea of having women quota, elaborate something in a good way, at also at the management team, because I'm sure that we can find talented women, we can build good pipelines, and we can help also to have in the future more CEOs, which is a big problem everywhere in the world. That's, that's a good point, and um, we will take that. Does anyone else have um, a call to action that they would like to share before I open the floor for questions, since we're almost out of time? Okay, does anyone have a question from the audience for our speakers? Don't be shy. Okay, yes, in the back. Um, do, we, do we have microphones that we can, that we can, the, the lady in the pink, yes. So, um, there is this constant debate as to whether you have to have legislative reforms in order for government in, to reflect, you know, women's, um, uh, women's leadership. Um, and, 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 this, and I put this on the table because in Mexico, they literally had to put a, uh, pass a constitutional reform so that there would be gender equality in the legislative branch. So if you look in Mexico, which is incredible, they have 48% women. Uh, legislators, but that has to do with the constitutional reform, and we're starting that constitutional reform also affects uh, the candidates in the upcoming elections. So the parties have to put equal amount of women and men for, and it's very difficult to implement, but they're doing it for the next uh, the next election. So we're going to have more women governors and more women um, mayors in in the next six or seven years, and uh, and ideally, what they're trying to do is that it had to be a through the Constitution to have that equality. So I guess the question is, in country, it seems that the only way to reach that type of equality, you have to legislate. And I know there's a debate, you don't like quotas, but my, it's in me, if, is it possible that the business community in general will be able to pressure themselves and their stakeholders will pressure these companies in order to have that equality because it almost seems that a law has to be imposed in order for that equality to be reached. 
Who is your question addressed to, or is it um, just it just, open? just in general? Because I know there is going to be different differences in opinion. I know there is quotas, but it, there gets to a point when you have 20 years gone by or 10 years gone by, and you don't see that quotas reflected in action. Is that just the ultimate weapon? Do you just have to legislate it? Who would like to take that, Matthew? Well, I think one of the, the points we were talking about earlier is the importance of governance and also um, reporting and metrics in governance. And I think we're seeing a you know, big move towards, towards that. And the business community is very powerful within itself because it consists of, of investors, it consists of businesses, and it, uh, it consists of their customers and their clients. And if those forces within the business community can become aligned with the recognition and the need for greater transparency and clarity, then I, th I believe you can achieve probably more than governments will be able to achieve by, by uh, regulating. Um, yeah, and I've sold that area to Greece and with Brest. Who is I think, um, I think someone asked. should tell Blanca <laughs> that she still has her microphone on. Yeah. But then we were talking about that a little bit outside about the, you know, the importance of the, 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 the governance in, in ESG. And it really is, I think, the most important part of that, uh, yeah. that matrix. Well, what we can see is historically, we would have, for can someone? No, I think she got away with the mic, maybe. Can someone take care of Denise's uh, <laughs> microphone? I think she's gone away with the mic. <laughs> Does Denise want that? Or about? Yeah. Okay. One, two, yeah. What we had historically, we had on one side employees that wanted something. We had uh, uh, customers that wanted something else. What we have now is an alignment of what customers want, what employee wants, and what the financial world wants. And this has changed over the last two years. So yes, historically, the political will was there to represent uh, uh, consumers, because you know, uh, you know, politicians are here to defend the population. Right now, I believe that businesses are in a better shape to build a better world, because financial, uh, uh, financials as well have moved in that direction. And as a, you know, uh, as a CEO, it is much easier to defend the idea of diversity, of equality, of your responsibility towards the world today than it was three to five years ago. And the laws also are changing in that matter. You know, the laws on, on boards, on responsibility of the boards, and therefore the pressure to the CEO to be more responsible is there as well. So we, I think we've never been in a better position Although, you know, it was said at the beginning of the conference that we had gone back 36 years, uh, I, th I hope, or I believe that with conferences like this, we're going to catch up quickly and move forward in the good direction. Okay, um, we will leave it at that. We could go on for, for a couple more hours, um, given the importance um, of the topic. But I would like to thank our speakers and the audience. And um, that's a wrap. All right.